go over chapter 22 here, um, electrostatics. And um, what I'm going to do here is um, start the PowerPoint uh, presentation. And um, when you get to a question, you want to pause, uh, pause the video, and uh, go ahead and uh, you know take your time and think about the question. Just to save time, I'm not going to read the questions. I'll let you just pause it on your own and uh, think about the question and then answer it and then you'll see the answers I click through but like I said I'm not gonna take that extra time or whatever just to keep the video rather compact um, so today's topic is electrostatics alright uh, electricity is basically um, the f I like to think of it as a flow of electrons um, from one place to another so that you have an uneven distribution of electrons in one place and uh, where they flowed from you have kind of leftover um, too many protons because some of the electrons have been moved to another place that's that's the way I kind of think of uh, electricity um, some properties of electrical charges um, uh, like if you had a object that didn't have enough um, and electrons it would be left over with a positive charge a net positive charge they would repel each other uh, if, the, if you had two objects uh, two pith balls um, suspended by strings like uh, like you see here in the picture uh, basically what would happen they'd repel each other likewise if you have too many electrons on two pith balls and they're suspended by a, a string you'd basically have um, you would have them repel as well. So the rule that you're going to learn there is that uh, like charges repel each other. Unlike charges, however, attract. So if you have a negative charge, too many electrons, uh, a positive charge pith ball, uh, not enough electrons, they're going to attract each other. Okay, and again, uh, basically the, the basic unit of charge is the electron. Um, and it also, it, it actually has, even though it's a much smaller particle, it has the same charge as a proton. Uh, the proton is, is a much larger, about 2,000 times uh, more massive particle, uh, uh, but it has the exact same charge with the opposite sign as an electron. Neutrons are also in uh, the nucleus. They're kind of like the glue that holds the, 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 pro, the positive protons together, keeps them from flying apart. Uh, those have no charge, but they have slightly more mass uh, than a proton. Okay, um, so every atom has uh, positively charged protons in the nucleus in the middle, and every atom has electrons that are in uh, orbitals around uh, the nucleus. Um, and we've talked about these here. Um, and I'll just restate um, neutrality of, a, of an atom. So if an atom has the same number of electrons and the same number of protons, that's the most stable way an atom can be because the charges balance out and you, and you basically have zero net charge. But if you take some of those away, uh, like you take some electrons away, there'll be too many protons, that atom will seem like a po it has a positive charge. And we call these ions. Okay, and there we go. A negative ion would have too many electrons, so that the negative uh, amount of negative charges end up overpowering it. Um, the electrons, uh, like I said, are in different orbitals, and the the closer they are to the nucleus, the more tightly they are bound to the nucleus. Because you can imagine, it takes work to pull two objects that attract each other away from each other, uh, and the ones that are closer in. Uh, take more work because you have to um, the attraction the attraction force is actually stronger uh, closer to the nucleus just like an object as it gets closer to the earth the, uh, the gravitational pull of gravity gets stronger and stronger well the same is true for an electron when the electron falls in the innermost orbitals it is more strongly attracted to the protons in the nucleus than when it's in a more distant orbital okay so um, now one of this basic section is about uh, statics or static electricity. Uh, the way that happens if you comb your hair and some of the electrons are stripped off and left on the comb, 
then the comb ends up having a negative charge and your hair is left with a positive charge. Okay, go ahead and pause it. All right, moving on. There's the answer. Okay, conservation of charge. If you start out with something that has a zero charge and you make it negatively charged, then the other object has to pick up a positive charge. And that law is never broken. and It's never seen to be broken in the universe. So if you, um, there's um, situations in the universe where a, uh, a particle can actually be created from energy. And whenever an electron is created, it also it has to be created in pairs. One, to conserve momentum. Uh, so one electron will shoot off in one direction, the other electron will shoot off in the other direction, conserving momentum. Uh, but one of the electrons has a, a negative charge, and the other one has a positive charge, and that's matter-antimatter pair creation. And um, there's all kinds of different conservation laws, but that's an important one in physics. Coulomb's law is just like gravity. It's uh, the attraction between two charges are inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So what that means is that if you double the distance of an object, the, the strength of attraction between the positive and negative charge would be dropped by fourth. Likewise, repulsion, if you, if you moved something out twice as far away, the repulsion would be four times as weak or one fourth the strength that it was originally. Uh, again, if you move something uh, closer by three times closer, then it's going to be nine times stronger. And uh, the way that you would actually use this equation is uh, Q1 and Q2 are the charges um, of those objects. And uh, these are for point objects. So it's, you're basically assuming the object is, uh, is really small. Um, and you um, assume that's like a point. It's an infinitesimal little dot in space. And the second charge, uh, Q2, is the other charge, the opposite charge. And D is the distance between the charge uh, and that distance would be squared. K is, uh, is called the Coulomb constant. It's 9 times 10 to the 9 uh, nano, uh, newtons per meter squared per Coulomb squared. Okay, there's another question. Go ahead and pause. There's the answer. All right, uh, so gravitational forces are only attractive. You can never have gravity repel something. Uh, electrical forces can be either way, just depending on if they're both positive, both negative, they're going to be repulsive. But if they're opposite charges, they will attract. Okay, another thing that can happen, and this is a fun demonstration to do in the class as well, um, is if you bring a balloon that has a negative charge to the wall, uh, the balloon can stick to the wall. Not that the, the wall already had a charge, is what happens is the molecules in the wall will uh, flip around and uh, face the negative charges. The positive charges of the, the atoms in the wall will face, the positive sides, I should say, will face the balloon and allow the balloon to be attracted uh, by virtue of those molecules rotating around. All right, conductors um, mostly consist of metals. And as we've talked about in, in class before, that uh, conductors uh, have an available sieve and electrons that are free to move around the material. While the atoms are stuck, the, the, the rest of the atoms are stuck in their place. They're not free to move around because it's a solid. The electrons are in this thing called a Fermi C. And they're able to just kind of cruise around um, the, the material as much as they want. And other uh, materials like glass or ceramics, uh, wood or anything like that, um, the electrons are bound and they're not free to wander around from atom to atom. Uh, there's, uh, those electrons will stay there in that particular place. All right, semiconductors are materials that sort of behave as an insulator or sort of behave as a, as a conductor. And um, some of them um, only conduct electricity when light shine on them. And uh, certain types of layers, they could be used to make uh, switches like transistors, 
Um, so some um, semiconductors, when you put them together, or different types of semiconductors, will actually emit light. That's a light emitting diode. Okay, go ahead and answer the question. There's the answer. Okay, a superconductor is something that is perfectly conductive. Uh, usually in physics, many things we talk about are approximations to the truth. So uh, when we talk about objects falling freely and free fall, um, a lot of times in our problems, even though in real life there would be air resistance, just to make the problem more simple, we're just neglecting air uh, resistance. Because if we're dropping uh, lead balls from the top of the house, uh, the resistance of air would not be a significant factor in testing how long it's going to take to fall. It would turn out that it would be pretty close to the, the time it would take to fall in a vacuum. However, uh, this is a special case in physics where something that's actually perfectly zero. There's no resistance. It turns out that in a uh, superconductor, if you had current flowing in a loop in a superconductor, it would be rotating around in that loop forever. Uh, and uh, the reasons why are pretty complicated. I'm not going to get into it um, uh, in this lecture, but uh, uh, just know that it's actually zero. It's not something that has a very low resistance, um, but it's something that has actually zero resistance. And the interesting thing is that you can have a current flow with no voltage, which any, anywhere else in, in our normal day-to-day day -day life, the only way that you're going to have a current flow is if you have a voltage between a difference between point 0.1 and point 0.2. That will cause uh, charges to move uh, from the higher voltage to the lower voltage, and that's your current. In a superconductor, you don't have to have that potential difference. The voltage could be the same at two places, and it's still going to flow. Um, uh, another thing to note about superconductors is they don't work at room temperature. You have to get them very cold. Um, uh, there are some special superconductors that work with liquid nitrogen, which is relatively warm compared to the original superconductors that were discovered, like uh, lead, it turns out, is a superconductor. But you have to get it nearly zero degrees Kelvin. The only thing that can heat it or cool it down to that cold of temperature is liquid helium. Uh, so uh, the superconductors in an MRI machine where you go to get a, a cav uh, go into the cavity and get your body scanned, uh, you're actually surrounded by a superconducting magnet and uh, that it's cooled with liquid helium as well. All right, uh, charging and uh, statics is charged by friction. So you just rub these two objects together and one um, and basic electrons are going to go from one to the other selectively. So one object's going to pick up electrons and one object's going to be stripped of electrons. Okay, another way things could be charged is by induction. So if you were in a, a city that is having a thunderstorm, uh, the charge in the bottom of the cloud tends to be negative in thunderstorms. Well, what's that? What that's going to cause is all the negative, a lot of negative electrons in the bottom uh, of the cloud, uh, toward on the top of the city there to get repelled away from the cloud. So what ends up happening is it leaves behind a positive charge on the tops of steeples and trees and everything like that, and uh, that is called induction because there was no charge there. There was nothing rubbing on it. There was nothing to cause a charge to form. It's just the presence of the cloud uh, repels the electrons and the positive charges are left behind. That is induction. Um, you can also do this little demonstration here uh, where you have two uh, metal spheres and um, you, you have them in contact with each other. You bring a charged rod next to it um, and then um, without touching it, now that, that defeats the purpose of of doing this demonstration. You don't want you don't want to actually touch it with your hands, but you bring the rod close. Positive charges will be attracted to the A side, and negative charges will uh, repel to the B side. Now, if you keep the rod there and move them away, uh, or separate them so that they're no longer in physical contact with each other, with each other and you remove uh, the rod, then those uh, positive charges actually become trapped. So you're actually making electricity, but you don't get something for nothing because these things 
or oppositely attracts, it actually takes some work to separate them away from each other, a tiny little bit of work to pull, to pull them apart. And that work goes into um, the energy that's stored in, in, in these metal balls. Okay. This also can happen in an atom. So what can ha if you put an atom in a nuclear field, uh, the electron cloud and the nucleus can move around and kind of separate themselves uh, from each other. And we call this state of kind of a polarized molecule. Water molecule is very polar uh, because you have two hydrogens that are slightly positive on one side of the water molecule and the oxygen, which is slightly negative. If you put that in an electric field, the water molecule will align itself opposite that. So if you put uh, an electric field with positive on the top and negative on the bottom, um, the, 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 the atom will turn and align itself to where you have the oxygen molecule, which is negative charge, will be facing upward, and the hydrogen will be facing downward. All right. Um, so that's kind of what was going on with the wall, is that you can have basically positive charges um, facing the balloon. That's because all these molecules in the wall have rotated themselves and allowed the, the balloon to stick to the wall. All right. Um, the, the cool thing where you could see this, uh, you could see this uh, happening is if, I like the demonstration where you put a bunch of uh, little pieces of um, paper, like a little hole punch. You can take the paper dots out of a hole punch and set it on top of a, a highly positively charged, statically charged thing like a Van de Graaff generator. And you turn it on and, and the little dots will get attracted all the way down to the bottom of the cup first. But once they start building up a positive charge, they'll start shooting out of the cup and make like a little snowstorm. It's kind of fun. All right, and we talked about this. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pass on this slide. Uh, water molecules, like I said, the hydrogen is the more positive side, um, and the, the oxygen is the more negative side. So it has a, a thing uh, called a dipole moment. That means if you put it in an electric field, it will rotate uh, so that the opposite charges are facing uh, the opposite side. So you got negative on top, the positive is going to be facing up. And the uh, negative or positive on bottom, uh, the negative will be facing down. Electric field um, are lines that that move out radially from a point. What I mean by radially, just think of like spokes on a wheel are radial to the the hub of the wheel. Um, they move out from a positive charge and move into a negative charge. So pictured here is as a negative charge, so you have the, the charges pointing in. Positive charges, they're pointing out. All right, and uh, you can kind of see that electric field on the top of this lady's head, basically. You've got, uh, she is carrying a, a charge from the Von de, Van de Graaff generator, and uh, what happens is her hair picks up this charge as well, and it starts repelling each other while well, the, the, the hair is actually following the lines of electric force that's kind of radiating out of her head. All right, so um, just like gravity, uh, when you lift an object against Earth's gravitational field, it's capable of doing work. And you see that here on the left side in, in picture A. Um, and if you release it, that um, potential energy turns into kinetic energy. Well, the same thing happens between charges. If you pull on the pulley, you're doing work uh, by separating these charges because they're attracted to each other by the Coulomb force that we mentioned earlier. If you cut the string, it's going to fall and collide, and, and there's your stored energy gets converted into kinetic energy. All right. Um, so you can kind of think of it as a spring that stores energy and an atom what has to happen is the kinetic energy uh, when or the potential energy instead of turning into more kinetic energy actually turns into light so if you have an electron fall into an atom it's got to emit a photon of light to conserve energy because it's moved from a state of high potential energy to a state of low potential energy all right, um, and the, the formula for electric potential or voltage is the electric potential energy divided by the amount of charge. 
Uh, so then you just get, uh, it's like how much um, energy you have per unit charge. Again, it's called voltage. Okay, so here's an example. If you have uh, twice uh, the charge in the same location, um, you're going to have twice the potential energy, but you're going to have the same voltage because you have you have increased uh, the energy you would get um, if you let those if you let that object fall or be repelled away from the the positive charge, um, but you also increase the total charge so those two things exactly cancel out in this case uh, so you're increasing the charge um, and you're increasing the energy but since the distance is the same uh, amount away you, you wind up it ends up being a wash they just cancel each other out and it's still one volt all right so go ahead and pause it and interact with this question All right. Okay. Um, electric potential. Um, uh, basically, um, a voltage, if you ever pick up a battery and look on the side of the battery, it's about one and a half volts. It could be nine volts. Um, but static electricity is actually has incredible amounts of voltage, like uh, the voltage that you see when you see a little spark jump from your finger to a doorknob is probably around 10,000 volts, but it doesn't kill you because there's very limited amount of charge. Um, the only time it's dangerous is if you think of a lightning bolt where you have both high voltage, like millions of volts, and a lot of charge put together. But just just the voltage by itself won't kill you. It has to. And there has to be a lot of charge to back back that up as well. All right, uh, so this is a thing called a capacitor. Basically, we have two uh, metal plates and charge them with off opposite charge. You can remove the battery and the charges will remain on the plate. So it's basically storing energy in the plates. If you were to touch the plates together, you get a big spark and all that energy would be released. All right. Okay. So basically, charging a capacitor, um, the, the energy will not flow um, forever. If you connect a capacitor to a battery, it's only going to charge until the voltage across the capacitor equals the voltage across the battery. Then that back voltage will prevent any further charge from flowing on the capacitor plates. Uh, this is a Van de Graaff generator. This is the internal workings. Um, this takes advantage of uh, one of the things that uh, Michael Faraday noticed is that voltage can exist inside of a metal sphere. So you have a metal sphere here and a way for the current or the charge to escape and go to the outside surface because a static charge always wants to remain on the outside surfaces of a conductor. So when you give it the little escape path, of the little metal collector points, that little thing that looks like a broom at the top, that collects the charge and allows it to escape to the surface of the Van de Graaff generator. And then the conveyor belt goes back down uh, completely free um, of, of any electrons. Now when it gets to the bottom, the top is going to be charging, um, the top is going to be charged, the little pulley right there is going to be pulling uh, or pushing the electrons off because of the just the static friction between those things rubbing together and so what you have is a continuous supply of electrons going being pulled up the conveyor belt and getting brushed off by the the collector points at the top and so the the voltage as long as the humidity is not too high and the uh, the tube is nice and clean uh, that charge can build up to you know millions of volts but still not a lot of current. It's not super dangerous. It can be painful to get shocked by one of these, but it's not totally dangerous. And that was the end of the presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and uh, stay tuned for the uh, chapter 23 because um, uh, Tuesday was a two-chapter lecture, two lecture. Have a good night.